Hello, I'm Hannah, and this is Hannah's Books. I hope you will forgive me a bit today as I try to get my booktube sea legs back under me, and even my reading sea legs back under me. First, let me tell you that last week, my son Abe and I drove up to Boston so we could each see old friends and also visit a few places we love. The time away from home was actually quite healing for me. I'd spent a lot of the previous two weeks feeling a bit towed under by all the end-of-life paperwork that I had been doing. But being in another city, away from our file cabinet, allowed me just a little space to breathe. I did a bit of writing about David, and I walked around areas I had explored with him whenever we visited Boston while our son was in college. And I did a lot of reading. I also had the great pleasure of visiting Hyde Cottage one evening and visiting Steve Donahue and Frida. The three of us filmed a video together, The Ultimate Book Tag, which was apparently created right around the same time that Booktube started. I'll leave a link to the video hosted on Steve's channel. On one exceptionally hot day, I managed to get myself to the Brattle Bookshop for a short visit, and I'll put up a video sometime soon showing you what I chose to stick in my tote bag. Since I arrived back home to the Washington, D.C. area, I have returned to filling out forms and trying to do some cleaning, but I've also continued to read and to write, and I thought I'd talk about those latter things a bit today here on BookTube. First, it is, of course, August, and August has a few pretty special theme months here on BookTube. Faulkner in August, Women in Translation Month, and Garb August. I've already gotten started on the first two, and on top of that, I'm participating in a buddy read of a book that meant a lot to my husband, David, but which I have not yet read. More on that in a minute, but let me start with Faulkner in August. This year, we're reading Absalom, Absalom, a book I haven't read since I was probably in my very early 20s. I fell in love with Faulkner partly because my father loved his works. He even wrote a little bit about the author. As most of you know, I grew up in the U.S. South, as did my parents and grandparents, but I went away to college in New England. And although I had read and hated an abridgment of Faulkner's story, The Bear, in my high school literature anthology, I'd never read any of Faulkner's novels in high school. In fact, that stupidly abridged story is precisely why I had not read anything else by Faulkner. One day in college, I ran across a used copy of his Light in August, one strange day, back when I was a freshman in college, I think, the afternoon a huge snowstorm began. My first snowstorm. With snow blowing around my window, I crawled shivering under the quilt and stayed there almost all day. I was completely fascinated with light in August, and I finally understood why my father, an historian of race in the 19th century South, who had turned away from his family in some ways to seek an education and to become an activist in the civil rights movement, why he was so enamored with Wagner's novels. In the next few weeks, I read The Sound and the Fury, and then eventually Absalom, Absalom. My favorite Faulkner novel back then was The Sound and the Fury, and my father's was Absalom, Absalom. And although I've read a few additional Faulkner novels since then, and a few different author biographies and critical works about Faulkner, I haven't read Absalom, Absalom for more than three decades. It's nice to be back. To start with, this is a book that has sort of a double plot. The story of Thomas Sutpen, which I'll get to in a moment, and the story of how the past, both the reality of the past and particular cultural meanings of family stories, continues to resonate and shape the future. We'll see a lot more about that secondary plot next week. At any rate, when we meet him, Thomas Sutpen seems to be a poor white man who is attempting to recast himself as a man with both money and respectability. The story of the fractures 
that occur in his family is told by four different narrators. This week, for Faulkner in August, we read the account of an older woman, Miss Rosa, looking back on her youth, sharing her memories with a young man, Quentin, a boy who has grown up in Yaknapatafa County, the fictional world Faulkner often wrote about, and who is preparing to go off to Harvard for college. It's sometimes hard for new readers to understand Miss Rosa's story. She's talking to someone who knows who everyone is, and she's talking like the old Southern storytellers do, rambling and recursive with references that are sometimes hard to decode. Quentin's father then fills in some of the story in the next chapter. And his version is more straightforward than Miss Rose's telling, but he's not necessarily more correct. He didn't live through the events himself. And as we'll see in the coming weeks, we're going to get the story filled in even more from two additional narrators, one who's even more removed from the time, and then one who is less connected emotionally. Through these last two narrators, we'll see even more that this novel is focusing on how the past is assimilated into the present and how struggles with the stories and assumptions of the past continue to shape identities in the present. As Faulkner said elsewhere, the past is never dead. It's not even past. Despite the fact that Faulkner is writing about the echoes of a South deeply shaped by tradition, including the practice of chattel slavery and violent racism. The novels, written early in the 20th century, are examples of literary modernism, partly called that because of his narrative style, but even more because he's fundamentally most interested in how people try to make sense of themselves. And while many of his modernist peers are trying to make sense of the fracturing of the world caused by World War I, Faulkner sees the roots of it decades earlier with the fracture of his world caused by the American Civil War in the 1860s. Well, more on Faulkner in August next week. In addition to Faulkner, I've started reading a book that almost everyone on Booktube seems to have already read, although I have not. Amor Tolls, A Gentleman in Moscow. This book has quite a history in my household. It was one of my husband's very favorite novels of the last few years. And he picked it up because his neuro-oncologist recommended it to us shortly after David was diagnosed with brain cancer. I don't fully understand why I was so resistant to reading it. It felt almost like I was violating something. But right after David died, I knew that I wanted to read it very soon and I wanted to follow it with a couple of other favorites of David's, some of which I had read years ago, and some which I've not yet read. In one of my very first forays, back into watching a handful of booktube videos, flipping through the videos that just happened to be at the top of my subscription feed, I saw that Kathy Grimm, the Grimm reader, was thinking about reading it too, and I asked if she might be interested in reading it as a buddy read. She was kind enough to say yes. And then Christina at the channel Knitting, Books, etc. joined in too. I am so glad to have the support of such wonderful women in what I know may be a more emotional book for me than it might be for many readers. A Gentleman in Moscow is such a calm and straightforward read, such a light read compared to Absalom Absalom, And as I've gone between the two novels, I've often felt like I had whiplash. Toll's story traces the experience of Count Rostov, condemned by a Bolshevik tribunal to remain in the Hotel Metropole for the rest of his life. I'm not going to go into detail about the particular section of the book we read for this week, since we haven't had our group discussion yet, but I'm intrigued by the way Count Rostov tries to make sense of himself in this new situation. He's fundamentally a man of the aristocracy, who until his hotel incarceration thought of himself as a person with utter freedom and a great deal of power. Now, though, he's trying to create a new sense of self, 
in this entirely new context. I say entirely new context, but it is really a change mostly in his freedom to come and go. He's not forced to give up the relatively opulent lifestyle he'd had before, unlike the hardships that were being experienced by those who'd been sent to Siberia, or even what it was like to live free in the Soviet society right outside the hotel's doors. Okay, another group reading project during August is Women in Translation Month, a time to read anything written by a woman and then translated. To be honest, I read very little contemporary work in translation, so this booktube project was just the encouragement I needed to commit to something. I picked up Tiamo by the award-winning Norwegian author Hanna Orstvik, translated by Martin Aiken. All I really knew about this book was that it was a story of, quote, passion, suffering, and loss. And although it's technically a novel, or actually a novella, I guess, I gather that much of the book is very autobiographical as well. Tiamo's the story of an author caring for her increasingly ill partner after his diagnosis with cancer. At first, she's so stunned by his diagnosis that she can't think of anything other than the deep pain of knowing that he would die. And as the pain of cancer got more and more intense and his death became closer, the narrator began to feel the sadness that was becoming, quote, quieter in a way, more than the shock that it had been before. This is a really heartbreaking book, and somehow reading about the experiences of someone who had lived through something so similar to what I've been experiencing this past year or two made me feel accompanied. But it's also very different from the way David and I went through this. Orstrovic's narrator and her partner cannot talk about what is happening to them. The narrator is ready to try to come to terms with the reality of her partner's imminent death, a death she wants them to face together. But her partner refuses to acknowledge the twin facts that his illness is terminal and that his decline has become steep. And his physician refuses to talk about these facts with them too, even telling the narrator that she should not talk to her partner about it either. Why can't we speak the truth, she says. Why can't we say things the way they are, she says. Why do they have to hide your death from you? Do you really not want to know, not be in contact with, not feel the truth about yourself? What she doesn't quite say is, why do we have to be separated by this dishonesty, the hiding, the refusal to acknowledge the truth? which makes her feel that she's lost the closeness with her partner even before he actually dies. Well, just a bit more book talk. In addition to these texts, I've been reading advanced copies of forthcoming books with the goal of getting myself back to the habit of publishing written book reviews. Before David started his final slow decline, I was reviewing for a handful of newspapers and online journals, all made possible because of the tutelage and the encouragement of BookTube's own Steve Donahue. I put formal reviewing and publishing aside for the last many months, but now I think I'm ready to try again. I absolutely love reviewing biographies of literary figures, and I have a couple on tap right now while I was in Boston, I read a short study of Willa Cather, an author whose novels I adore. But that book won't be out until November, so reviewing is on hold right now. And after I got back, I read a study of George Eliot and her thoughts about and her experience of marriage, including the loss of her longtime partner. That book will be published quite soon, so I'm sitting down to start the review this afternoon, I think. And then there is a Shakespeare book or two, and a big new biography of August Wilson coming out soon. I'm excited about all of those books, and I'm really hoping that it will be therapeutic, rather than idiotic, 
to commit to reviewing these books right now. Well, thank you so much for joining me here today. I have a really busy week coming up, so I may not be able to pop in again until next weekend. Take care until I see you again here on Hannah's Books.